Is your trend making you go crazy? Stay tuned on what to do. created Species Nutrition with one mission in mind, to provide bodybuilders and serious athletes with no-nonsense supplements that work. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. RxTelevisionRxMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, your 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. We do this every week right here on this channel. We take your questions from the Dave Palumbo Experience app, from our Facebook page, our Instagram page, our YouTube community page. And this week, we're going to record we did the show pre-recorded. Uh, many weeks going forward, we're going to be doing the show live, but scheduling restraints um, ensured that we were going to be recording the show. But nonetheless, uh, this is your forum. Get your questions in, whatever it be. Uh, bodybuilding or non-bodybuilding related, be it diet, training, supplementation, life, IP pros, competitions, obviously the big mega show this past weekend uh, in Prague with Martin Fitzwater and Chris Bumstead, obviously Chris Bumstead making his open class debut. So whatever you have on your mind, this is your form. We're going to go right into the first few questions from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. How can I reduce anxiety while taking EQ or trend? Well, I mean, one of the <laughs> easy answers that they would be, first of all, EQ doesn't cause anxiety. I, I, I don't know where that ever got attached to anything. I mean, all anabolics can theoretically in people who are have a, uh, anxiety issues increase it because they do increase your androgen levels in your brain. Uh, usually the drugs like testosterone and uh, trenbolone would be more, or if you took like Anadrol or Dianabol could do that more because they raise androgens really high. So a lot of times guys will be on testosterone and then they add EQ and they think, well, it's the EQ that's making me, you know, have anxiety or whatever, but it really isn't. It's the combination of the two. It was the testosterone more so than the EQ. EQ is pretty, pretty mild. If you took that alone, you wouldn't have any, there's no, it's not really high in androgens. Um, it's certainly lower than testosterone. Whereas trend alone is higher than testosterone. And that's why a lot of people have problems with that. When some people who do have anxiety disorders, I tell them don't even take trend. It's just not worth it. Meaning that if it's going to ruin your, the way you feel all the time and you're just going to feel crappy uh, because you can't handle the high androgen content because it gives you severe anxiety and you're going to wind up having to take Xanax and stuff like that, then that's, that's not functional as far as I'm concerned. Uh, some people can't take trembolone because it upsets their digestive tract. They just get diarrhea and they because it, it it stimulates the, the GI tract a little bit. And some people can't take it because they can't sleep at night and they wind up having to take sleep medication. So, or they wind up you know going crazy in bars or or yelling at their girlfriend. You have to know what your personality is when you take trembolone. Some people it's just not made for. And I look, I work with a lot of people and they tell me, Dave, I can't take it. And and I'm and I really respect the fact that they're that you know, insightful about who they are, <laughs> that they know that they can't do it. And and that's fine because I mean, yeah, it's one thing if you have to take a, you know, a little piece of a Xanax to go to sleep at night, you know, a week or two before your competition because you're starving to death and you're, and you're anxious, but it's another thing. You can't be on that all the time. That's just not functional. So EQ shouldn't be a problem. I know, you know, somehow some bro science got out there that that is a problem. It is DECA EQ, very mild. In, in that sense. Sometimes if your milligramage is too high, like you may be taking 2,000 milligrams of testosterone a week, you should be taking 1,000. Uh, that could be a problem too. So you might want to cut back the total milligramage. Um, as far as trend alone goes, you know, 
I usually recommend that people take my nighttime sleep aid, somalize to be able to fall asleep because it, the GABA kind of has a, um, a neuroinhibitory effect that kind of relaxes the brain and then the melatonin keeps you in a deeper state of sleep. I take it every night. I have ter- tremendously good sleep from that. And that seems to solve the problem for most people, but some people it's just too much. And some people take too much Trembolone. I see people taking 900 milligrams a week. I'm like, you're out of your mind. 150 milligrams a week, 50 milligrams three times a week is more than enough of tranacetate. You do not need to take more than that. And if you do, you're going to be getting side effects. So another solution might be to cut back the dose of the trend that you're taking as well. Uh, you know, these are things that you have to kind of go on an individual by individual basis because some people are affected more than others. Well, before I take the next question again from the Dave Pullenbo Experience app, I have to say, Dave, you absolutely nailed the... Uh camera lighting and everything like that you look very sharp today i don't know what the difference oh. is between yesterday <laughs> after hours uh heavy muscle radio and then today you, you look absolutely like prime studio quality right now oh uh, thank you i turned up the light a little bit i, I don't, it was it was an accident it's like experimenting <laughs> with it's like experimenting with your trend doses you got to find the right you know the right amount that works right so there you go uh, second question again, these first two questions from the Dave Palumbo experience app. Um, I, I know we've discussed this topic now really over the course, um, you know, many times over the course of the last two weeks. Yeah. Um, and that is the impact you think RFK Jr. is going to have on this country. And obviously I would say, yeah. let's focus that up on you know, as as nutrition is concerned as far as I know you talked about it yesterday and after hours, as far as, you know, his role in terms of trying to clean up the FDA, trying to clean up what's in our food supply. Yeah. Uh, what impact do you think he's going to have uh, over the course of this next presidential term? Let, let's keep it focused for this question to food because and supplements because that's what we're, we're, we're worried about. I don't want to get into the FDA and drugs and stuff like that because that's a whole other rabbit hole we can go down. Look, I've been saying this guy is going to be awesome for this country for since he started running for president over you know a year and a half ago. I, I, and I, and I was, I was actually very troubled because I knew that I, you know, I was a Trump supporter and I knew Trump had the ability to win and he probably as a third party candidate didn't. Um, and so I didn't know how I was going to reconcile this in my brain, but Trump reconciled it for me. He, he brought him on the team, you know, which is great. So I got both, we got both Kennedy and we got Trump, which is, which for me, you know, I think, and for what we're looking to do in this country is, and, and the improvements we need, I think that that's going to be good for the country. But Kennedy is great because he wants to, you know, listen, we're being poisoned. We don't even know this. You see, I think I eat healthy and I think I, I, you know, eat the right foods and everything like that. But even the foods that I'm eating are being poisoned by certain things. And I didn't even know some of the stuff. You know, I never thought GMO crops were bad. I didn't know that they were bad because I think, well, who cares if they throw an extra gene into the into the corn? It's not going to change the corn. But what the reason they do that is because the corn then becomes impervious to pesticides so when they spray that front line on the corn it doesn't kill the corn now you say well why what is the corn why would they change the the genetic makeup of the corn so they can resist pesticides well because then they can douse the stuff with even more pesticides and the pesticides kill everything they kill all everything that's growing in the area except the corn and then the corn grows and no bugs eat the corn because they, they can't because they, they are saturated in pesticides, but then we eat the corn that has the pesticides. So no one even knows that. We don't even know that. And they do the same thing with the wheat and everything's made from wheat. You know, all the, anything that's, you know, grainy has got wheat in it. And so we eat all the carbs we eat have that in there. Same thing with oatmeal. They saturate these, these, you know, we're eating so many pesticides and then not to mention talking about your kids, you know, your kids with all the, you know, the candies they eat and, and some of the, uh, you know, cakes and cookies and stuff like that. They have all these d- food dyes in them that are terrible for these kids that can cause autism and they cause all these different problems down the road. Metabolic syndrome. I mean, think about how many kids have, a, have diabetes. I mean, kids, why should kids have diabetes? Kids can metabolize everything. It's not the foods. It's not the fact that they're eating sugars. It's the fact that they're eating artificial sugars like high fructose corn syrup or that they're taking in these these terrible preservatives that are in the food. So I feel good that he's going to go in there and clean up all this stuff. In other words, he's going to say, listen, drug, uh, listen to the food companies, you can't put this, this, and this, and this, and this in the food. Make it some other way. They do it in Europe. Guess what? The Fruit Loops are just not going to be that fruity looking. They're going to be a little less colorful. But you know what? It's going to be safer for the kids to eat. And so I, I'm pretty happy with what he's doing. And I think that once he cleans up the initial the initial run, I think 
And then he starts getting a little deeper into supplementation. I don't think he, people are saying, oh, he's going to ban supplements. He's not going to ban supplements. The guy takes supplements. He's just going to make it safer. And I think that that's a, a very important uh, thing that should be done. I'm more worried about the food supply. I, I think they should they should ban uh, farm-raised fishes, to be honest with you, because I think they're also terrible for you. I don't know if they'll go that far, but I think that we have a really good guy who's looking over you know what we got, what we're doing right now. And remember, this is a guy who's on HRT. He believes in all these you know peptide modalities. I, I guarantee you, we might see some more peptides being legalized with him in power there, because he's going to make recommendations to, to Trump, who's going to help help make recommendations to these companies. And we're going to see a lot more longevity stuff approved. I know he's all into these uh, psilocybins and the um, hallucinogens for you know PTSD. So he's going to be really good for our industry. And, and, and I'm, I'm excited to see what's going to happen. These two questions, by the way, from the Day Palumbo Experience app. It's an app I offer. You can download it from your Android or uh, iTunes store. It's $29 a month. You get me as your coach in your back pocket, all my writings, all my videos in one place. We put up a workout every week. We, I answer uh, everyone's questions in an open forum so everyone sees everyone's questions and answers. Really good learning experience. And I do a Q&A video. It's like another Ask Dave just for the app members every single week. Never miss. So <clears throat> you're going to want to check this out. With Christmas coming up, it's a great stocking stuffer. Uh, you can get your boyfriends or ask your, your wives or girlfriends to buy it for you. 29 bucks a month, it's, it's a great deal. And thank you guys, by the way, for all the support. We have a tremendous amount of members, and uh, everyone participates in a very positive way. Let's go to our Instagram, our Facebook, our YouTube community questions. First on Instagram, uh, Akshay Pandey, good friend of the show. Is it okay to drink a large amount of coffee if you don't see any side effects from it? I take around 550 to 600 mg of caffeine from coffee and still see no side effects in my body. Is it safe to take in the long run? So I guess it's not even like a bodybuilding related right. question, more of a caffeine intake right. question. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't even know how much caffeine I used to consume back in the day. I mean, seriously, uh, when I would go to California, like Venice, you know, before competitions, when I was starving, I was drinking like four, five, six cups of coffee a day. Who, who the heck knows how much caffeine I was getting? Now, there, granted, there weren't energy drinks in the warm pre-workouts, so I wasn't. Oh, I probably wasn't getting as much caffeine as some of you guys get today. But what happens is you become immune to the central nervous system stimulating effects of the coffee, so you don't even get you don't even get stimulated anymore from the coffee. But what happens is, <clears throat> as you keep taking more and more and more, it can raise blood pressure. Okay, and uh, that's what you don't want in your body. So you got to keep an eye on your blood pressure because it constricts the vessels. So while you're not stimulated and you don't feel like you're, you know, your heart's not beating faster because you're, you know, you're used to it, you might actually have some high blood pressure from it if you're taking in too much. So check your blood pressure, get a cuff like this, they're like 10, 15 bucks, auto inflate. And uh, I buy mine on Team U, but you can get them on Amazon too. And check your blood pressure throughout the day. If it's normal, then you're good. If it's not normal and it's getting very high because you take it, then you're gonna have to cut back your caffeine. To be honest with you, I find that if, you know, my little experiments I do myself, the less caffeine you take in on a daily basis, when you do use it, it works really well, like almost too well. Uh, I was telling uh, the After Hours crew, I was the, <laughs> I bought some kombucha. I didn't know it had black tea in it because they kind of don't list it on the ingredient list. It was kind of listed further down. And I was drinking it at night one night and I, and I couldn't sleep. I was like, crawling and going crazy about it. I didn't know what was going on because it, it, it has caffeine in it. It kept me up. So the less you use, when you do use it, it's more potent. So try not to overdo it. Uh, I mean, we've discussed this one before, but I mean, just from a fundament, fundamental perspective, that's from uh, Made Man. By what mechanism of action do steroids actually increase strength? Anadrol seems to do so quickly. So I was curious about what is occurring to do so. There's a couple of theories on, on the way it works, but a lot of it has to do with uh, leverage in the muscle. So, you know, anadrol causes a lot of fluid retention too. So the fluid around the muscle kind of acts as like a hydraulic lift, you know, and it gives the muscle a better something, a better, uh, I guess the, the fluid around the muscle allows the muscle to contract harder because it's, it's like leverage for the muscle. Uh, anytime you get more pumped, you know, you get super strong. That's why right after a competition, when guys eat like maniacs and they retain like 40 pounds of water, you know, in, in a day or two, which is not healthy, by the way, 
uh, and then they go to the gym, they feel super strong, which is, which is dangerous because you can tear a muscle because the muscles are way stronger than they should be. So that's one of the effects. Anabolic steroids in, in general will increase strength. And I don't know if anyone really knows the exact mechanism. I'm sure there's an act of myosin increasing of uh, contractility uh, element to it that I can't elucidate very well because I don't know the, the mechanism behind it. I'm sure I could figure it out if I wanted to, but it's probably it, it, it's a moot point. It makes the muscles contract harder. Uh, clenbuterol does the same thing, by the way. Clenbuterol is not an anabolic steroid, but it's an asthma medication. But if you ever take clenbuterol and you get cramps, it's because it's making the muscle contract harder. And most people notice they're a lot stronger when on the clenbuterol. So anabolics and, and clenbuterol do the same thing. But the reason why the drugs that make you retain a lot of water, D-ball, anadrol, um, and one of the reasons they work very quickly, but um, they also, it's because of the fluid retention aspect. Testosterone too. You could take, that's why when you take Prima Bowl and Winstrel, you get a little stronger, but not that much stronger because you're not holding as much fluid. And I think that's, I think it's the fluid retention aspect of these anabolics that work better. That's also why you can take a lot of anabolics pre-contest, but you're on low carbs and, you, and you're not retaining any fluid and you lose strength. Okay. It doesn't, right? You're always strong when you're eating a lot of food. You're not as strong when you're not eating a lot of food and you're depleted because of the fluid retention aspect of it. Let's go to uh, Jay Corsi. I know you mentioned your hematic crit tends to get really high. I also have issues uh, with it as high as 60 to 61. Are you concerned with tanking your iron stores from frequent blood donations to lower the hematic crit? Yeah, that, that is a concern. You ha and you have to keep an eye on that. That means that because what he's explaining is that when you lose red blood cells, because you let's say you're dumping blood or donating blood, you're losing the iron that's inside the red blood cells. Whereas normally, if you don't dump blood, when your red blood cells die, your body recycles the iron and uses it. Now, women lose iron every month, right? Because they menstruate. Um, when, so when they're losing that blood, they're losing the iron as well. But, you know, the foods that we eat do have iron in it, you know, red meat and stuff like that and green leafy vegetables. So you are getting iron in your diet, even if you're not taking an iron supplement. And I usually recommend that men do not take an iron supplement because iron overload, too much iron is not good either because your body stores it in the liver and the heart and the kidneys and can damage those organs. So the key is to get blood work every, you know, six months or so and just see if your iron and, you know, ferritin levels are normal and your red blood cells are normal or, or and or a little high, then you obviously have enough iron. If you all of a sudden, if for some reason, I don't know if it was after one of my surgeries, might've been after the heart surgery, I was, I was low. Like my, my red blood cells, I was a little anemic almost looking. I didn't feel it, but I saw it on blood work. And it turned out my iron was a little low. And I'm like, in the history of my life, I've never had low iron, you know? And I did it. And if you're going to use iron, by the way, you want to get heme iron, H-E-M-E. -E. Heme iron is the best, most absorbable. You can get it on Amazon. It doesn't matter what brand you use. I use Life Extension. But heme iron, and you do it for like a month. That's it. You just take it for a month if you're a man, and that's it. And that will usually restore iron reserves, and then you're good. Very rarely do I see people who are bodybuilders low in iron as, as men because we do eat a lot of food. And all the foods we eat have iron in it, you know, unless you're a vegetarian, which most bodybuilders are not. So keep an eye on it. It's great to you know test your levels. Usually, what you'll see is that you're that you're you have a the problem is that you're low because you're not eating enough of the right foods. But like I said, very rarely do I see people get low from giving blood once a month or once every two months. Let's go to uh, Let's go. Alexander Ruin, training coach. Is there a reason why people use four IU's GH in the morning versus two IU's in the morning and two IU's six hours later or before bed? Some people like to take a lot of shots every day. I think that's what the, I think that's the right answer. I, look, if you're taking four IUs, you can take it all in the morning. You really don't need to split it up. Some people like to split it up. They, they feel better. I've done it both ways. I don't know if there's any difference, to be honest with you. I think that uh, I think you're less insulin resistant when you take it one time a day. I think when you take it twice a day, you, you have the potential to, be, to, be, to have more insulin resistance because the GH is in your system more throughout the day. Whereas in the morning, if you take it, you get a bigger IGF surge early in the, in the day when you're the most catabolic. And then it kind of it wanes off as the GH kind of leaves your blood and you lose that, that, um, that insulin resistance from the GH. I always felt that worked better, you know, the bigger surge. Now, if you're taking 10 IUs of GH, which I don't recommend, you would want to split that up because your body wouldn't be able to respond to 10 IUs in one shot. In other words, your liver would not produce that much more IGF than it would produce if you were taking four IUs. So you'd be wasting it essentially. So in that sense, you'd want to split it up. But if you're taking four IUs, you can probably do it in one shot. Uh, let's go to uh, Nicholas, uh, Nicholas Cantemir. I'm going to check my, uh, I think my cord, it might be, uh, let me just make sure my cord is plugged in here. All right. 
you can keep going to oh, you, yeah, yeah no you, i was gonna say you you are still on camera and the sound is yeah yeah keep so. going i just know okay. something's going so uh, nicholas cantamir wants to know uh says that there recently there have been a lot of um products like pre-workouts that contain glycerol your opinion on this and you know i guess what role does glycerol play say in a pre-workout okay I've used glycerol. You know, glycerol has been around since the 90s. Bill Phillips was recommending glycerol for pumps back then, and, and they didn't even have pre-workouts then. Uh, what glycerol does is when it enters the blood, it's at first of all, it, they haven't really defined it, but it's really, it's really a, a component of fat. When you talk about a fat molecule, you talk about the three fatty acids and one glycerol molecule. So every fat molecule is made up of three fatty acids and a glycerol molecule. So glycerol is a technically a component of fat, but it kind of can act like a little bit of a carb. So back in the 90s, what they used to do is put glycerol into like protein bars and they wouldn't list it as a carb or a fat. So you thought you were eating this like carb-free bar, you know, and you didn't even know the cal you didn't even have to list the calories from it. So it, it was a little deceptive, the marketing, but what glycerol does is it seems to, when it goes into the bloodstream, it pulls fluid with it. So it gives the, 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 the bloodstream a volumizing effect. So you get a better pump when you're on glycerol because of that, because you got more volume in your blood in your bloodstream. Now, sometimes that can raise blood pressure, sometimes not. Depends on the person. The problem with glycerol is once your body metabolizes or gets rid of it, you know, breaks it down in the system, all the water that it pulled into the into the bloodstream now goes out of the water and can go under your skin. So a lot of guys used to try to carb up on glycerol or use it the last day of a show to fill, you know, to make themselves a little bit more pumped on stage. And then what would happen? It would it would get metabolized in the middle of the show and then and all of a sudden they would start spilling and it would look terrible so i always recommend it to people not to experiment with glycerol for a show but if you're going to use it right before you go to the gym you'll probably get a good pump on it it tastes kind of nasty though it has like a like a terrible taste i know they have a, a powderized version of it that doesn't make it too bad it has almost like a nauseatingly sweet taste um in, in a way but it does volumize. I had a liquid creatine product, probably even before your time, Sid. It was called Creolize, the original Creolize. It was in a bot. Jimmy DeBull's uncle made it for me because he had a, a manufacturing facility. And it was their patent. And it was liquid creatine in a glycerol base. And that stuff gave you an insane pump. But, you know, like I said, it works. I would use it off season and I would use it in the gym, but don't use it to carb up. Don't use it pre contest, like to try to fill out and, and do it for a show. You're, you're looking to risk, uh, you know, screwing yourself up. Uh, Master and Muscle, actually, we got this question last week, too. Uh, he wants to know when you're going to do your next uh, Secrets to Becoming a Diet Guru course. Good question. Probably in January of uh, 25. All right. Let's go back to our YouTube community page. A uh, couple of questions about, I guess, seafood-related protein sources. The first one, shrimp. Shrimp, a good protein source. Can you eat it every day? Yeah, you know, uh, you know, I have this thing about shellfish. For a while, I wasn't even eating shellfish. I thought, wow, it's not good. They're scavengers. They eat off the bottom of the ocean, and uh, maybe they're not good for you. And uh, I, I think, you know, then I thought about the fact that all the, the big fishes we eat, like, you know, tuna and everything like that, have tons of mercury in it. So I, I don't think the shrimp is really that bad. I, I like shrimp and scallops. I wouldn't eat them every single day. Um, I think that it, with fish, and I hate to say this because I am a fish lover. I can eat fish for every meal. For I think you have to rotate around. I think it's not a good idea to eat, you know, uh, one particular seafood every all the time. Like uh, because I think of the fact that there is there is you know mercury or there is some toxins or potentially you know stuff that this the fish are picking up in the ocean. So every once every once in a while, I start getting like really paranoid about everything, and I start saying to myself, you know, I think a McDonald's hamburger is probably the safest thing to eat, even. <laughs> Even though it's got all the preservatives in it, at least it's got no mercury. It's got no, uh, you know, no, no, uh, you know, pesticides and all that other stuff. So it, the answer to the question is that the, I would rotate around. I think shrimp's fine to eat. I think scallops is fine to eat. I think uh, mussels and clams, I love those too. But rotate. Don't eat them every single day. You know, try to, you know, maybe one day have shrimp, one day have uh, uh, scallops, one day have, you know, salmon, one day have, you know, uh, although salmon is kind of my go-to, but recently I've been eating a lot of ground turkey, 99% ground turkey breast and ground chicken breast. I don't know why. I, what I do is I go by what my body craves. Usually my body craves what it needs. And I'll go six months in a row, I'll eat salmon three times a day. And then all of a sudden I don't want to eat salmon anymore. I don't know why. 
I, I just believe like my body says, all right, maybe there's, some, there's something in the salmon that you're getting too much of and you don't need it right now. So instinctual eating is good if you're good at reading your body's, you know, signs. If not, then try to vary your food sources. I think that's a good way to do it. If you're only eating salmon once a day, you're probably not going to have a problem. If you're eating, you know, shrimp once a day yeah. out of six meals, probably not a bad thing to do. I was going to say you 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 kind of answered the next question, and it was from RPE oh. about, um, it, you know, going heavy with tuna. They would say that they would have three tuna cans per session or whatever, which is, yeah. you know, equivalent of 70 grams of protein. But should they have any concerns with mercury poisoning at that amount? So, I mean, I guess you, you kind of yeah. answered that as well. Well, let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yeah. say something. I, I at yeah. one point in my bodybuilding career, was eating so much tuna from cans that – if, if, the, if I don't have mercury poisoning, then it doesn't exist because, I mean, I was eating like seven cans of tuna a day. I don't think that the, – and I know that people will say differently. I don't think the tuna in the cans, the albacore tuna, is the, is as bad as the uh, the big eye and, and the bluefin tuna sushi that we eat because the, the bigger the fish, the longer it's alive. And the longer it's alive, the more it could accumulate mercury in it. So while well, there's small amounts in everything, it's the load. So in other words, you know, if you're eating a couple of cans of tuna a day, you're probably not getting as much mercury as having a few pieces of sushi or sashimi in, in the sushi restaurant. Even though that's a better quality fish, it has more mercury, according to, you know, what I'm reading. So once again, I still eat. Do I still eat tuna? You're damn right. I do. I love it. You know, but, you know, I don't overdo it. You know, I'm not eating it, you know, 16 times a day, you know, but I, I have in the past and I never had any problems. So I, you know, like I said, you can get your heavy metals checked if you're, if you're paranoid, you know, and there's, you can buy like EDTA. It's the letter E D T A. It's like, it comes in powder form. It's a chelating agent and it, it, pu it will pull heavy metals out of your body. I used to, for some guy got me onto it. I was doing it for a little while every at night before bed, I would do a scoop of it, like two grams of it. And, uh, you know, on an empty stomach and supposedly it helps pull heavy metals out of your body. You know, I don't, you know, but once again, if you're paranoid, go get tested. If you're, if you don't have high mercury levels, then don't worry about it. Eat the tuna. I don't think the tuna in the can is bad as, 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 as bad as they think. I really don't. It's because it's not the same tuna fish. It's a smaller fish. Take one or two more questions. This one is from uh, Sean P. Just this past weekend, there was the Prague Pro. It was a prime example of a two day show. Uh, Saturday pre-judging, Sunday finals. How would you peak someone for a two-day show? A lot of times, a lot of times show day, you mostly eat carbs and not so much protein. How do you ensure that the athlete stays full but comes in dry and crisp as the first day? Yeah, what I do is I I do my whole first day protocol. You know, I feed them throughout the day, usually four ounces of protein, I'll, I'll, which is a lot less than they normally eat, with you know whatever 50, 60 grams of carbs per meal. I uh, usually give them, you know, like a burger and fries after prejudging, you know, and then what I would do is if this if the next, if there's a show the next day is I would let them drink as much as they want the rest of the day after, after prejudging is over before bed, I would usually give them a half a diuretic, like half a diazide to flush out whatever they ate. And then I would repeat exactly what I did for Saturday on Sunday again. So I would do the, my usually do pancakes and eggs in the morning and then I'll do some you know, cream of rice and eggs is the next meal, some tuna, and some chicken and, um, you know, rice after that and some rice, you know, and, and then depending on when the, how, what time the finals are, I might even do another burger and fries if the finals are not till that following night. So really my protocol doesn't change. The only thing I do is I feed, I give them a cheat meal after prejudging, which I would give them anyway. And then I let them drink unlimited as much as they want until they go to bed, half a diazide at bedtime. The next morning, usually they, they wake up even better than the day before. The key is not to restrict fluid after prejudging. Some people say, oh, I don't want them to bloat by the next day. Well, they're not going to. There's no way. They're so depleted. You have to replace fluid. And then you just give them a, like a, a very mild half of diazide before bed. And that always fix, That always does the, the trick. And then if, look, you, if not, you can take another half in the morning. I, I've never seen a case where you need it, but it, it's available. The, the worst thing you do is start doing all kinds of crazy kooky shit. You just do exactly what you did, but you got to replace fluid. That is the number one thing that people don't do, and they forget, and that's why you come in super flat the next day. That's going to do for this episode of Ask Dave right now on the channel. All new episode of the After Hours podcast, and then we uh, uploaded a clip from uh, – 
the Dubai Muscle Show, which was a couple of weeks ago. We did a full interview with Honey Rambaud. I asked him the whole spectrum of questions about Chris Bumstead, about Honey Rambaud, about, I'm sorry, Hadi Chupan, Derek Lunsford, everything about uh, Hani's coaching career. We put up a clip of him telling the story about exactly how he became Chris, uh, Chris Bumstead's coach. Uh, obviously, the timing of it was you know right, just given the fact that Chris – uh, competed this past weekend and once again announced his retirement. So that's available on the channel right now. And then, of course, a uh, full breakdown of the Prague Pro, Dave Palumbo, King Kamali, and Chris Aceto. Uh Heavy Muscle Radio, a great episode Sunday night, uh, a little live episode. So check all those cha- shows out on the channel right now. The only thing that I would tell you is that, again, between uh, the video tab and the live tab, because we do mix it up now throughout the course of the week, we have our live episodes and we have our uploads, so make sure you check both tabs so you're not missing anything. If you like what you're watching, hit the like button, comment below, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you're not going to miss anything that we have, be it live or be it on our video tab. Of course, um, this past weekend, between the pre-judging and finals of the Prog Pro, we did live reaction shows, and we will probably do more of that You know, for these big IFBB Pro, at least for the men's open class shows, what have you. Um, so the next one is going to be in Alicante, Spain in December. So we'll see what the lineup is. If it warrants it, we'll de- we'll do another live reaction show for that as well. So again, uh, subscribe below, hit the notification bell, hit the like button, comment below. And as always, we appreciate all of your support. For Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next time.